position, Luke. Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23. If you'll be kind enough, if you're able, if you'll stand as we honor the reading of God's word. Luke chapter 23. I'd like to begin reading with verse 33 from Luke 33, or 23, verse 33 from Luke 23. And I'm reading this morning from the New American Standard Translation of the Holy Book. You may read a little bit differently from the translation you have. You have the King James or the NIV. Luke 23, verse 33. Hear the word of the Lord. And when they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right and the other on the left. But Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots, dividing up his garments among themselves. And the people stood by looking on. Even the rulers were sneering at him, saying he saved others, let him save himself. If this is the Christ of God, his chosen one. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming up to him, offering him sour wine, and saying, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. Now there was an inscription above him, this is the king of the Jews. And one of the criminals who were hanged there was hurling abuse at him, saying, Are you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other answered and rebuking him and said, Do you not even fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? We indeed justly, for we are receiving what we deserve, while indeed, but this man has done nothing wrong. And he was saying, Jesus, Remember me when you come into the kingdom. And he said to him, Truly I say to you, Today you shall be with me in paradise. And it was now about the sixth hour, and darkness rolled the whole land until the ninth hour, the sun being obscured, and the veil of the temple was torn in two. And Jesus cried with a loud voice, said, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, breathe his lives. Now when the centurion saw what had happened, he began praising God, saying, certainly, this man was innocent. And all the multitudes who came together for the spectacle, when they observed what had happened, began to return, beating their breasts. And all his acquaintances and the women who accompanied him from Galilee were standing at a distance, seeing these things. May the Lord just bless me upon his word. And he sanctified in our hearts. Father, we thank you for your word. The of your word gives life. And now we pray that you open to us the uncertain riches of Christ. That we may behold Jesus from the sacred page. And speak to us to the end that those who have never come to faith in Christ, they might hear the gospel that he died for their sins according to the scripture, was buried and raised from the dead on the third day. That sinners might be reclaimed that backsliders and carriage, that the saints might be revived. Speak to us, Lord. Your servants are here to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I want to speak to you this morning from the subject of conversations at Calvary. Conversations at Calvary. This is the high day on the Christian calendar, what we know as Easter. And Easter really corresponds to the Jewish feast of first fruits. As a matter of fact, on the, the Jewish calendar, we would have observed Passover and this past weekend. And then after Passover, which is celebrated to recognize the event when God passed over the Jewish homes in Egypt. And even though the firstborn of every family was, was killed, the firstborn Jew was not killed because they had obeyed the word of the Lord and they had taken the blood of the innocent lamb and they had struck the blood on the post and over the door. And that blood of those innocent lambs, it signified the blood of Christ. His blood would be shed as they paid for our sins. And all of those who are under the blood of Christ are safe and secure in God. So then on the first 
day of the week following the Passover, the Jews would observe the first fruits. And the first fruits was an observance where they would take the crop, the first crop that had come up, and they would offer the first crop to the Lord as an offering, as a sacrifice. And by faith, they would say, we believe if we give the Lord the first, then God will bless that which remains. And that first fruit, it signified the resurrection of Christ. He would be the first one that would rise from the dead and to die no more. And the first one was the promise that all of those who believe in Christ, even though they die physically, one day they'll be raised again. And so we celebrate the Feast of First Fruits. But to get the first fruits, to get the Easter Sunday morning, you gotta make a pit stop at Cal. This dreadful place in Israel is the shape of a skull, and it's called the place of skull. And it was a place that the Romans had set aside for crucifying convicted felons in Jerusalem. But we must first do some spade work. How did Jesus get to Calvary? How did he end up on the cross of Calvary? And those of you who are familiar with the Christmas story, you know how the Virgin Mary was overshadowed with the Holy Spirit as she conceived a baby in her womb, even though she had never known a man. And nine months later, she gave birth to Jesus the Christ, the God-man, God in human flesh. She and her husband Joseph nurtured this young baby. At the age of 12, they took him into Jerusalem to observe one of the feasts. And when they were they started back home, they noticed he was not with them. They went back to Jerusalem and there he was in the synagogue, there in the temple, and he was debating and lecturing and conversating with the doctors of the law. And they said, son, you've upset us. You've upset us. We were worried about you. And he said to them, how is it that you seek me? Don't you understand? I must be about my father's business. And 18 years later, he steps up in the synagogue in Galilee. He steps in the synagogue, he takes the Old Testament scroll of Isaiah, and he turns to Isaiah 61, and he says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, who has known me to preach the gospel to the poor, healing to those who are sick, recovering of sight to those who are blind, deliverance to those who are captive, the acceptable year of the Lord. And then he said, This day this scripture has been fulfilled in your ears. And he closed the book, and he sat down. That was the beginning of his earthly ministry. He called 12 ragtag disciples. They were fishermen, ex-tax collectors, ex-insurrectionists, people trying to overthrow the government. And he called them and said, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. He was invited to a wedding in a place called Canaan of Galilee. He shows up there at the wedding feast, and they ran out of wine. His mother Mary comes to him and says, son, they're out of drink. And he says, woman, what do I have to do to you? My hour's not yet come. She instructs the servants, do whatever he tells you to do. And Jesus tells the servants to fill the water pots with water. And when they went to draw the water out of the pots, it had miraculously been turned into wine. And that was his first miracle as he honors the wedding there in Canaan of Galilee. And so he begins this miracle traveling extravaganza in Galilee, the northern province of Israel in Capernaum, in those places that the rest of the world had forgotten. And he preached the good news, the gospel of God's kingdom, that God did not come to call righteous people, but sinners to repentance. And so the pimps and the prostitutes and the thugs and the tax collectors were gathered around him because he was saying to them, there is forgiveness in God. God comes to offer you forgiveness of your sins, salvation. God wants to give you a place in his kingdom. And so his miracle traveling bonanza, it leads to the northern part of Israel and he makes its track down into Jerusalem. And so he comes into Jerusalem and there he preaches the gospel. And the multitudes, the masses of people, they're totally dumbfounded because he teaches with such power and such authority and with such clarity and clarity. And they're beginning to understand that maybe God is ushering in a new kingdom. And so his popularity skyrockets with the masses. With the masses. But that causes him to run into direct conflict with the religious establishment of the day. The chief priests, the scribes, the Sadducees, the ruling class of Israel. They were called the Sanhedrin. Seventy men who established policy for that part of the world. And they saw in 
making Jesus a threat to the religious and political and social power base because the multitudes were coming to him. And they were hypocrites, so they turned the great faith of Israel into a religious enterprise. And so they were trying to rid themselves of this lowly carpenter from Hitsville, a place called Nazareth. And so they followed him around trying to bring up some charges where he could possibly impugn himself or undermine his own integrity and credibility because of inconsistency in his teaching. But they could find no fault in him. And so for three and a half years, they, they followed him around looking for a crack, looking for a, a chip in the armor, and they couldn't find one. And then finally they recognized within the apostolic band that was one who was really a treacherous traitor. He was a narcissistic, self-centered individual by the name of, of Judas Iscariot. And he had not bought into Jesus' vision of a new world order, that poor people and pimps and prostitutes and the outcasts has a place at God's dining table. He wanted to see Jesus throw off the rule of the Roman government, set up his kingdom, and give him a politically appointed position. And so Judas becomes disillusioned, and so the religious leaders come to him, and they conspire, and they said, what, what? How can we entrap him? And Judas said, well, what will you give me? And they offered him 30 pieces of silver. And Jesus, Judas sells out the sweet rose of Sharon. He sells out the lily of the valley. He sells out the living Christ for 30 measly pieces of silver. And so now they have what they need. They plan for his arrest. And after Jesus had observed the Passover with his own disciples, they sent out law enforcement to arrest him. And so they come out with clubs and with spears and with sticks to arrest the Lord Jesus. And he had prophesied to the disciples that the shepherd was going to be smitten and all of his sheep were scattered. And he was speaking to the fact that once he was arrested, all of his disciples would leave him. And he would stand all alone to face trumped up charges in a kangaroo court. And so just one week before or five days before his arrest, he came into Jerusalem on a donkey, just a coat. And the people were crying, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, Hosanna, save God, save now God. They were laying down palm leaves on the street and laying their clothes down on the street. And they were receiving him as if he were royalty. Now he's arrested. And he stands all by himself. It's because this is a conspiracy that has been put together by the quote-unquote religious brain trust in Israel, those supposed spiritual leaders that conspired to arrest Jesus, trouble charges against him, force the Roman government to execute him by crucifixion because they wanted him to be crucified, not merely stoned. Because if he was crucified, then that would send a statement to the Jews that this man really was cursed of God. Because the Jews believe anyone that hanged on a tree by crucifixion or by hanging from the neck, they were cursed of God. So they wanted Jesus totally discredited. Not that they did not only want him dead, they wanted him totally discredited. And so they got their plan. And they come again. And so you would pick the narrative in chapter 22, verse 54. And I want to just kind of move through this till we get to Calvary. And so in 54, 22, it says that Peter was following him from a distance. Peter's what, Peter was Jesus' ace. I mean, he was the head of the apostolic band. Peter had declared, Lord, though everybody else forsake you, I will never forsake you. And Jesus said, Peter, shut up. Before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. And you're going to flee with all the rest. And so he's following him from a distance. Peter's warmed himself in the fire, by the fire of the enemies of the Lord. And a little girl, a servant, comes up and says, I, I know who you are. You are one of those Nazarenes. You are one of those followers of Jesus. And Peter laid aside his religion and started to curse. Blank and blank, blank and blank. I don't know the man. A few minutes later, another man said, oh, you, you one of those Galileans. You, I don't know the man. And finally, a third person says, you are one of those Galileans because you speak with the same accent as those hits from Galilee. And then Peter began to swear and to curse. I don't know the man. I don't know the man. And then the rooster crowed. And 
And Jesus looked at Peter. And Peter looked at Jesus. And Peter dropped his head. And the Bible says he walked away and he wept bitterly. When he had a chance to stand for him, he denied him and swore with the oath that he did not even know him. And some of us here would say, I would, I would never do that. I would never deny the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, yes, you would. Oh, yes, I would. We often deny him when we should stand up and speak boldly and courageously on his behalf. Yet we freeze up at the mouth for fear that people will ostracize us or withhold privilege from us. My heart was so blessed on last night of watching the, the ball games there and the head men's basketball coach, Mike Davis from the University of Indiana. I ain't never liked Indiana. I ain't never pulled Indiana for nothing. As a matter of fact, when anybody's playing on TV, I'm rooting for whoever Indiana is playing, whoever Duke is playing. Never liked any one of those schools. But this guy won my heart because he reminds me of Jason Chick. He stands up boldly in the arena and says, look, God has given me faith. And he said last night, God is showing it don't take a big name to do big things. And the man said, y'all got to get ready for this ball game. Y'all playing, playing for the national championship in the final four in Atlanta before 50,000 people and millions of people watching. What is he going to do tomorrow in practice? He said, we don't practice on Sunday. <laughs> he said, I'm going to send the boys to church. And whether he wins the game or not, he said, the boys can go to church. Coaches and I get together Sunday afternoon and watch the film. We'll get them with the boys on Sunday. We have a policy. We don't practice on Sunday. And that's conviction. The biggest game of your life, under the big tent, on the big stage, people are scrutinizing everything he does and everything he says, and he stands boldly on national television and gives God the glory. He says, not about me, about my name, it's about the Lord who's given me favor. That's what God is looking for. That's what God is looking for. Sometimes we don't realize we're denying the Lord when we won't speak for him. We deny him when we won't live for him. We're denying him when we won't stand up and bear witness to the reality of the resurrected Christ. We deny him when we take credit for things we know that God has done. We boast in the homes we own, the cars we drive, the clothes we wear, and the job that we have, and we fail to realize the acceptance of the Lord on our side. Where would we be? We don't realize we're denying him. We're robbing him of the glory that he so justly deserved. We deny him to talk about how much we love him and how much we want to serve and we'll follow him every step of the way. And then we can't be bribed or begged or persuaded or convinced to come out and pray to him. Help me, Holy Ghost. You don't know have to come to here this morning. We don't have time for him. Our personal plan, our palm paddle, our calendar is already too cluttered. We don't have time for him. And we don't realize we deny him by our very lifestyle. Well, people are looking at us and we say, well, I'm going to heaven when I die, whole soul and body, and saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. And yet they see us not willing to sacrifice to serve him. You show me someone who serves God faithfully, I will show you someone who sacrifices consistently. To serve him because this world is always pushing against us. It is always trying to preoccupy us. It is always trying to break our concentration toward serving the Lord. So just to serve him requires some effort and some sacrifice. Jesus says, if any man will be my disciple, let him take up his cross. The emblem of suffering and shame and disgrace. The emblem of death. You see, in the first century, the cross was some people wore around their necks. As a matter of fact, nobody wanted to cross around their neck because the cross was the emblem of death, of crucifixion. But Jesus said, take the cross and follow me. So there are times we deny him and we don't realize. Peter denied him. But because Peter really knew him, he wept after he denied him. Because you can deny him with your lips, but if you really know him, you can't deny him with your heart. If you really know him, you can't deny him in your heart because he lives in your heart in the person of the Holy Spirit. And when you deny him, he's grieved. And when he's grieved, you agree if you really know him. And so this is the night he's crucified, or betrayed and crucified. And so there's a piece of the fire warming himself. And let me move quickly. 
your Bible scholar, you read the text carefully, you find that Jesus actually had six trials. All of them were illegal because they all took place at night. It was illegal by Jewish law to convene a trial at night. It was illegal by Roman law to convene a trial at night. When they arrested him, they first took him to a man by the name of Annas. Annas had been the high priest. His son-in-law, Caiaphas, was now the high priest. But Annas was really the, the power broker behind Caiaphas. And Caiaphas was just a mouthpiece. Annas was running the show. So they took him first to Annas, and they condemned him to be crucified before Annas. That way, Caiaphas would know what he was supposed to do. And so Caiaphas then followed suit and said, this man has spoke blasphemy. He claimed to be king. He deserves to be crucified. So Annas tried him and convicted him. Caiaphas tried him and convicted him. But however, they want the Roman government to, to finally convict him. So then they take him to the, to the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin are the ruling Jews. So there were three religious trials, before Annas, before Caiaphas, and before the Sanhedrin, three religious trials, and all three religious trials, the verdict came back, he's guilty of blasphemy. Crucified. But they cannot legally crucify without Roman permission. So they then take him to the Roman official. They take him to Pontius Pilate. And Pilate is the governor of Israel. And they take him to Pilate, and they bring him in in 23 verse 1, and they begin to accuse him in the tense of the verb. They just keep on bringing accusations against him. He's misleading the people. He's forbidding people to pay taxes to Caesar. He claims to be king. They move this thing from just being a religious fight to a political fight. Because they knew that Pilate was not concerned about the religious nonsense. But when they say that Jesus is guilty of claiming to be king, that's high treason. That's a crime punishable by crucifixion because Caesar will not allow anyone else to be Caesar, to be king but himself. When he says he's forbidden people to pay taxes, that's high treason. And so they're trying to get Pilate to see this man is a political insurrectionist. And in Jerusalem alone, Caesar had had executed over 30,000 Jews. Accused them of insurrection, trying to overthrow the government. And so Pilate interrogates Jesus. He says, are you king of the Jews? And Jesus said, well, if you say so. And the chief priests and the multiple are there, and they, they're accusing Jesus. But Pilate says, I find no fault in him. Pilate says, not guilty. Trial number four. The first civil trial, Pilate says he's not guilty. They then went on to tell him, no, this man had been wreaking havoc all the way from Galilee in the north, all the way to Jerusalem. And Pilate said, oh, he's from Galilee. Well, Galilee, that's Herod's territory. So let Herod take care of this man. Herod just happened to be in Jerusalem at this particular time. So they are taken from Pontius Pilate, who is the governor, and they take him to Herod, who's like the mayor. So they bring him before Herod. And Herod had been intrigued by Jesus. Herod himself was crazy, actually. He let his own brother, Philip, kill so he could have Philip's wife. John the Baptist had went to Herod and said, it's not right for you to have your brother Philip's wife. Herod then incarcerated John, and on one night he was throwing a party, and they were all drunk. And his wife's daughter came in, and she danced a seductive dance before him. His hormones and lust starts to go out of control. He says, young girl, I give you whatever you want up to half of my kingdom. She having already been crying by her mother, getting rid of that John the Baptist. He's nothing but a troublemaker. So tell him that you want John the Baptist's head on a platter. And so the girl says, I want John's head on a platter. Herod now, bound by his own word, has John, innocent as he is, executed by being beheaded. But when Jesus came on the scene, Herod thought that Jesus was John came back from the dead. See, the Romans had all these superstitions, so Herod really was wanting to get on Jesus' good side. For he feared that John had came back from the dead and that John now was going to deal with him. And so the text says he had been wanting to see Jesus. And he had been wanting to to see miracles possibly performed. So they bring Jesus into Herod, and now Herod interrogates him. Verse 9, he questioned him for a long time, and Jesus wouldn't say nothing. He would not respond to Herod's interrogation. 
He would not respond to his intense questioning. Verse 10 of 23, and the chief priests and scribes were standing there accusing him vehemently, and Herod with his soldiers after treating him with contempt and mocking him, dressed him in a gorgeous robe, and sent him back to power. Herod says not guilty, but I don't like him either. So Herod has the soldiers to beat Jesus up, dress him up in a purple robe, and sends him back to power and say, you deal with him. But look at the text. In verse 12, he says, Now Herod and Pilate became friends with one another that very day. For they had been enemies up to that point. Even enemies can come together and conspire that Jesus has to go. Even though Pilate and Herod both find him not guilty in his first civil trials because of the pressure from the Jewish leaders, they now send him back to Herod and say, We want him retried. So he comes back to Pilate, I'm sorry. So Pilate summons the chief priest, they bring him back in. Pilate says, you brought me this man? And they said, this man is inciting the people to rebellion. And Pilate said, I've examined the man before and I find no fault in him. He's not guilty. He's done nothing worthy of capital punishment. And Herod has found the same thing. So Pilate said, this is what I will do. Thinking to himself, I can get rid of these guys. I will just punish them. I will beat him up. We'll whoop him up really bad. They'll feel sorry for him. And they'll drop the whole matter. And I don't have to deal with this whole situation. So how how it has Jesus just beaten? I mean badly beaten. They take a cat of nine tails, it's like a whip, and he had bones at the end of it. It would literally rip the flesh off of your back. He had it beaten almost senseless. And they were walking around Jesus, punched him with his fist, spitting in his face, and said, prophesy, who hit you? And so now Jesus is beating his face, is disfigured, his back is ripped open, blood is flowing everywhere. And then Pilate brings Jesus back out and says, behold, you king. He's nothing but a man. Thinking that they're going to feel sorry for Jesus, but to Pilate's dismay, they cry out, crucify him. Crucify him. Crucify him. Away with them. Away with them forever. Get rid of them. And then Pilate said, well, I got another trick up my sleeve. I'm not going to crucify this man. We have a custom here that every year I release, I release a known criminal to the people just to show them goodwill and good faith from wrong. And so I will offer Jesus and they will feel sorry and they will say, yeah, let him go. And so Pilate went into the record book and he said, who is the worst person we got in prison? Ah, Barabbas. He's a murderer. He's a thug. He's been reaping havoc in the neighborhood and in the community. And even the Jews despise Barabbas. And so I will juxtapose Barabbas and Jesus and say, which one do you want me to release under you? Pilate thinking that they're going to say, let Jesus go. Because we don't even want Barabbas coming back to the neighborhood. And to Pilate's utter dismay, when he said, whom shall I release under you? Jesus called the Christ of Barabbas. The people said, Barabbas, Barabbas, let us have Barabbas, the thug, the murderer, the insurrectionist. He said, well, what should I do with Jesus? They said, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. And three times Pilate says, I find no fault in the man. What evil has he done? But they demanded he be crucified. And so Pilate, being the coward and the political animal that he was, he caves in under pressure for fear that if this thing gets to Rome, he's in trouble, that he can't manage these little Jews. And so another text the Bible says, he gets a basin of water, and he washes his hands, he has to say, I'm clean of this thing. You take me, do with you what you want to do. And so they lead him away to be crucified. Give me a few more minutes and I'll be close. And so they walk him through the streets. According to the Roman historians, they were stripped the prisoners down naked, they would require them to carry their cross beam. They would nail their crime to the cross beam. And they would recite their crime as they were walking through the streets. They would lead them through the streets of the rooms of cross the place of the Via Della Rosa, up the mountain to Golgotha, Calvary's up on a hill. It's on the main thoroughfare coming into Jerusalem because they want people to be crucified publicly. Public humiliation for them and for their families. And so if anyone who dared commit a capital offense in Rome with no 
what the punishment would be. It's going to lead Jesus away, and along with him, there are two thieves that are also being crucified. And so they take him up to Calvary, and they nail him to the cross. And just briefly, listen to these conversations. Verse 34 of chapter 3. But Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them. Now listen closely. The tense of the verb there in the Greek is what's called the imperfect tense. It is repeated action in the past. So the whole time that Jesus is on the cross, he's saying, Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He said it over and over again. And the word that for forgive incurs the idea of releasing an undeserving person from a debt or an obligation. He said, Father, release them. Father, release them. They're undeserving, but Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. Now, was Jesus offering a blank forgiveness to everybody that was there? What was he talking about? The tense of the verb that forgive, he was saying, forgive them for this act. Forgive them now. Make a decision now to forgive them of this act of crucifying me. Father, forgive them. Make a decision now to forgive them now for this act of crucifying me. Then why would Jesus be so insistent that God the Father forgave them right then on the spot for the act of crucifying him? Because his whole death was a vicarious death. It was a substitutionary death. He was dying, bearing the sins of all people for all time in his body. But if God did not forgive them for crucifying him, then God could not forgive them of their other sins. Are you following me? He was praying that God would forgive them for crucifying him so that they would have a chance to be forgiven of their other sins. So the sin of the crucifixion of Christ, he's pleading with God, forgive them and forgive them now. Because I want them to have access to eternal life. That's how much God loves. We know the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Though he was rich, he became poor. He left his throne in glory. He got up off of this, the principles of his eternal reign. Stepped out of this royal diadem. Laid aside his royal crown. Walked through 42 generations. Wrapped himself up in human flesh. Was back to a place called heaven. Prepared to the cross to shed his blood. And there as a sin bearer on the cross, bearing his body, the full wrath of God, he prays, Father, forgive them. They don't live crucifying the sin. They don't let crucify the Messiah. They don't let crucify the Holy Hope. Forgive them of this sin. So when they come to themselves, they might repent and be saved. And that word there for know, they know not. In the Greek, it carries the idea they do not have conscious, cognitive thinking, logical deduction. They are temporarily insane, driven by their lust and their greed and the mob mentality. Now understand, the text that, in the Greek text, he's saying it over and over again. He doesn't say it once. And so while Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The other rules that, in verse 35, that are staring at him. Same text, imperfect text. They just keep on saying it. So he's saying, Father, forgive them. At the same time, they're staring at him. They're mocking him. They're making fun of him. They're saying, he saved others. Let him save himself. He saved others, let him save himself. If he's the Christ of God, if he's the chosen one, let him save himself. That's what they're saying repeatedly, over and over again. And what they did not know, what they were saying was actually prophetic. They said, save yourself and do it right now if you really are the Christ of God. You save others, can't you save yourself? They were exactly right. He could not save himself and save others. He had to be expended. He had to be sacrificed, he had to be offered up, and he came down off the cross, which he could have done. But had he came down off the cross and saved himself, then he could not be the Lamb of God slain for the sins of the world. So other people couldn't be saved. So he was offered up, the righteous for the unrighteous, the pure for the polluted. He could not save himself and save others. So he chose to die and give up himself so that others could be saved. So here's the scene. It's a symphony there on Golgotha's mouth. It's a symphony there on Calvary. They're smearing and jeering at him, and they're mocking him, making fun of him.
because of him, at the same time, he's crying out, Father, forgive them. But they're not the only ones in the conversation. The soldiers join and they mock him. And they said, if you're the king of Jews, save yourself. On top of that, the thieves were mocking and making fun of him. Same tense of the verb there in 39, and they were hurling accusations of him continually, repeatedly, over and over again. If you're the Christ, save yourself. And by the way, save us. And then finally, one of the thieves came to himself. And he said to the other thief, man, what's wrong with you? He said, we have been thieves, kleptomaniacs, rogues, convicted fellows. And we knew if we did the crime, we might have to do the time. And so we deserve to be crucified. We knew what the law said. And we knew that we could be crucified for our crimes and we commit those crimes anyway. But this man hadn't done anything wrong. This man is totally innocent. And then this, this guy is deep. He said to Jesus, he said, Lord, Jesus, look at verse 42. I wish I had time to work with this. I don't have time. But in 42, and it says that he was saying, the same tense of the verb, he kept on saying over and over again, the soldiers are mocking, making fun of him, sneering, Jerry. He said, Father, forgive them. And the thief is saying, Lord Jesus, when you come to the kingdom, remember me. Lord Jesus, when you come to the kingdom, remember me. Lord Jesus, when you come to the kingdom, remember me. Over and over again. And finally, Jesus stopped. And he said, true, I said to you, today, you should be with me in paradise. Today, you should be with me in paradise. And that's why we sing that great song of the church, the dying thief, rejoice to see the fountain in his day, and there am I, the vilest he, wash all my sins away. For this thief was saved on the cross because he looked over and saw Jesus Christ, the Son of God, dying in his place, taking the punishment that he deserved. And he realized the only hope for me is to fling myself at the mercy of the living Christ. And Jesus saved him there on the cross. And after taking time to save that dying thief, the Bible says he cried out with a loud voice, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last breath, and he pillowed his head on his shoulder, and he gave up the ghost. And then something else happened. Revival breaks out there on Capitol. The centurion, a Roman soldier, with a hundred men under his authority. He said, sure, this must be the Son of God. No one ever dies like that with, and with such triumph and such victory when they've been crucified. So the centurion, I believe, get converted to their own Calvary. Not only does the centurion get converted to their own Calvary, the Bible says, and the multitudes came together for this spectacle. And they observed what had happened and began to return, beating their breasts. That's a sign of contrition. A sign of brokenness, a sign of humility. Many people begin to realize we've made a major mistake. We have, we have been privy, we have been conspirators to the crucifixion of the Messiah, the Son of God. I just thought about to tell you. But even though Calvary was nothing more than a lynching, that's what it was. Jesus was lynched on Calvary. But even in being lynched, on Calvary, he was able to open the floodgates of the grace of God. That's the wisdom and the power of God. Man, in all of his evil intentions and his arrogance, think that he can walk and defeat the plan of God. But God makes the evil of men to bring glory to his name because even they were driven by their envy and pride and bitterness and hatred toward the Lord Jesus Christ, God even used that to bring forth the plan of salvation. Text goes on to say that a secret disciple, a man by the name of Joseph Bamathia, he went to Pilate and said, Give me the body of Jesus, please. And they took it away and they hastily buried him. And Pilate thought that he had rid himself of this controversial figure. Herod thought that he had escaped the controversy. The Pharisees, Sadducees, chief priests, and religious leaders, they thought they were over like fat cats. All was waiting. But the 
Bible says. That early on Sunday morning, early on Sunday morning, the women came to the sepulchre to pay their last respects to the risen Christ. And the angel said, why are you seeking the living among the dead? I know who you're looking for. You're looking for Jesus of Nazareth, but he is not here. He has risen just as he said he would. And you go on back in the town and tell Peter and the disciples. What are you saying? We, we serve a risen Savior. And we know that he lives today. We're not following fables and we're not following hoaxes. Jesus Christ, he lives. He was raised from the dead with all power in his hand. You say, preacher, how do you know he lives? Because he lives inside of here. He lives right here. I know he lives because when I want to quit, I can't quit. When I want to throw in the towel, I can't throw in the towel. When I want to throw my hands in frustration, I cannot throw my hands in frustration because something inside of here just keeps on stirring up inside of me. And when I want to collapse from the tent, something on the inside of me stirs me up and there's a release of energy inside of me and says, rise up, son, one more day. Got yourself on the back. He lives. He lives. He lives today. And we serve a risen Savior. And I'm not the only one that can testify. There are other folk here who can testify. Brother Chester come here who can testify, who just lost his mother. Ask him if he lives. Ask him how God not encouraged his soul and strengthened him. He lived. We serve a Christian Savior. He lived. He lived. And he's able to say to the uttermost and to the guttermost, I don't care how dysfunctional your life is. I don't care what addiction that you're dealing with. I don't care what habit it is. I don't care how long it's had its clutches upon you. Jesus Christ still loves you. And he had you in mind. When he hung on Calvary's cross, he had you in mind. He was hung up for your hang-ups. He was strung up because you were strung out. He wanted to find a way for you to be forgiven. You to be forgiven, and not only forgiven, but delivered. You said, preacher, you don't know how long it's been. You don't know how long it's been before I even had any urge that there was hope for me. If you're here this morning, you're only here because he lives. He lives, and he moved inside of your mind consciously and subconsciously. You ought to go to church today. As a matter of fact, you ought to go to 600 Cologne Boulevard West, Grace Bible Church. You ought to go with a handsome, bald headed guy preaching. And he's he got a word today. He lives. He lives. I, I wish I had time. I would finish. But if you get into a car, follow me to 549 Morning Dove Lane. Come there at 549. Come down in my basement, and we will finish this thing. He lives. Christ lives. And there's hope for you and hope for your family and hope for your children. Don't give up on your children. I don't care how different they are, the crack cocaine, prostitution, whatever it is. You keep praying and say, Lord, when you gave me that child, I believe that you had something for that child to do. I don't think it's going to end up like that enough. He lives. I was in my study this morning trying to get up here to the pulpit. Somebody called my phone. A friend of mine called me. She said, Reverend Watson, I tried to kill my son last night. What should I do? I said, get up and go to church. Get up and go to church and praise God and bless God's holy name and commit that boy to the Lord because Jesus lives. As I close, I'm reminded of a story. This little boy, some of you have heard this story. When I was a little boy up in Fayette County, I used to love to fly kites. We had big open spaces, wasn't many electrical wires. Wasn't no cable TVs, wasn't no cable television wires to be caught in. And we would go out and we would, in the spring of the year, this time of the year when the wind starts to stir, we would go down to Mr. Pearl's grocery store and buy a five cent kite. And we'd put that kite together and we'd go fly those kites. And see who, whose kite would go the furthest. And then we'd be adding strings to the kite. And after a while, we'd be way out of sight. And that little boy, he'd just stand there kite was so far up in the sky, I mean, you couldn't see it. It looked like it was up in the clouds. He had no idea where the kite was. He just standing there. Just standing there. Just standing there. And the old gentleman said, boy, what are you doing? He said, I'm flying my kite, sir. I'm flying my kite. And the fellow looked up in the sky and said, this boy crazy. He said, boy, you're not flying no kite. He said, oh, yes, sir, I'm flying my kite, sir. He 
said, what? Where is he kind? You can't see it. He said, I might have been sick, sir, but I know it's up there. I know it's up there. He, he, he said, well, boy, how do you know that a kite is up there? He said, because every now and then, I feel a tug on the end of the line. And you said, well, preacher, how do you know that Jesus lives? Because every now and then, I feel a tug on my heart. Every now and then, something's pulling me up. Every now and then, I'm reminded that this is not my home. I'm just a pilgrim. Every day is a gift. 
every day is a gift. It's a sacred trust. Every moment is an opportunity to respond to God's own to love. I plead with you today. Give your life to Christ if you've never done it. I've never found a single person that got saved and said, I didn't get ready to get saved. I wish I would have gave my life to the Lord. I've never found one. Never found a single person that truly got saved that regretted giving their life to the Lord. Now I know scores of people said, man, why not do that song? I wouldn't have made such a mess of my life. Maybe I could have been another father to the children. Another mother to the children. That's what I hear people say over and over again. Let's stand together. Maybe head bow, maybe eye closed. You're here today. The elders and deacons and counselors will be here. If you're here and you sense something tugging on your heart, I need to get saved. I want to be forgiven. I don't want to die like this. I don't want to keep living like this, uncertain as to whether or not I'm right with the Lord. If you're here today, just raise your hand where you are. Just lift your hand toward heaven. God bless you, man. I see that hand. Yeah, just hold your hand up with you so I can see. Don't be ashamed. Just lift your hand right where you are. If you want to be saved, just hold your hand. And right where you are, I just want you to pray this prayer. I want you to pray, Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I know I need to be saved. I cannot save myself. I believe you died for me. I believe that you was buried and raised from the dead for me so I could be saved and have my sins forgiven so I could spend all of eternity with you. And now I receive you as my personal Savior. I receive you right now by faith. I receive you into my life. In Jesus' name. And if you pray that prayer, here's what I want you to do. I just want you to slide out of your seat come to the front. Every head bowed, every eye closed. And no one will be watching you and looking to see who's going, who's coming. And you come. Someone will want to meet with you and pray with you. God bless you, sir. God bless you, man. Don't be ashamed to come. If you pray that prayer, you smile and you see you come. And we want to pray with you and we want to share with you from God's word. God bless you, man. still come. While the choir is singing, you can come. I know that the hour is a little late, and I apologize for keeping you over time. But someone needs to make a decision with Christ. If someone just gets, if you're hurting on the inside, you've been wounded in the past, you've been scarred, you're bitter, you're angry with the world. And everybody you see gets, gets mad at you. Certain people you get more angry than others because they trigger something inside of you. You don't have to live. What I'm saying is the Lord, he'll forgive you. And he'll replace that anger with love and forgiveness. You come, you can come. Don't be ashamed to come. 